Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about rainforests with guests Suzanne Pelletier, Executive Director of the Rainforest Foundation US, and Ginger Cassidy, Executive Director of the Rainforest Action Network. So thank you both for joining us. I'm so happy to be talking about the rainforests. You know, we see um, images, rather disturbing images of uh, deforestation in the rainforests, uh, some of the most uh, lush environments that we have on this planet. Uh, but I'd like to start off really talking about uh, rainforests and the extent of rainforests because we tend to associate rainforests with one area. We, we tend to associate rainforests with the Amazon. We also um, tend to associate rainforests with one type of climate or one type of, of uh, vegetation, one type of geography. But that's not really what rainforests are on this planet Earth. Ginger, could you start us off with just sort of an overview of what a rainforest is and where they are located? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having us. Um, yeah, rainforests are some of the most biologically diverse ecosystems in the world. And when I talk about, you know, there's different types of rainforests. There's coastal temperate rainforests. When we look at the Pacific Northwest and then there's tropical rainforests. When you talk about the Amazon, it's in the Southern hemisphere of the earth. And I like to say that our tropical rainforests kind of hug the lower part of the earth. And, you know, they're one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems that are really critical to not only stabilizing our climate, but also providing the oxygen that we, you know, breathe every single day. And, you know, one thing about tropical rainforests is, you know, they're some of the most biologically diverse ecosystems that not only provide, you know, homes for thousands of plant animal, you know, animal species, they're also home to thousands of indigenous communities that really rely on these ecosystems for their livelihood. So tropical rainforests and, you know, just rainforests around the world are really critical, you know, for not only stabilizing our climate, but supporting our everyday lives. So um, it's, you know, why Suzanne and I do the work that we do is protecting these really critical ecosystems, especially when we're facing one of the biggest crises of our time, you know, climate change. So um, tropical rainforests are one type of rainforest, but they're also temperate rainforests, right, Suzanne? Yes. Um, and, you know, one of the things that defines a rainforest is a lot of rain. Which is, <laughs> so when you think about, you know, the, the forests in the temperate areas, the Pacific Northwest, Americans are familiar with, there's forests that have a lot of rain. Like in the tropics, it's over a hundred inches of rain a year. Um, so there are forests um, in, in the United States, in the Pacific Northwest and Canada. So in that Northern belt, you know, Ginger talked about that belt around the middle in the tropics. There's also, you know, um, rainforests that are in Northern climates as well that are in temperate areas. And talk a little bit about the cycle that engenders the rain, because one of the things that, that we need to really come to grips with is that cycle that mm -hmm. creates the rain and that environment that uh, creates the home for various species, mm -hmm. flora and fauna, that cycle can be broken by human beings. Right, yeah. Um, one thing about tropical forests, like in the, in the Amazon, um, over half of the rain that falls in the Amazon is produced by the trees in the Amazon. So this is where there's this link, Mark, you're talking about. The trees have an important role in deforestation. This is where it comes in with when the trees are, um, when trees are cut down, that cycle of what's, you know, transpiration that they lift the water from, um, from underground, lift it up through the, into the, through the canopy, it goes up into the atmosphere and then comes down as rain. That cycle, you know, like I said, over 50 to 80% of the entire water cycle in the Amazon comes from the trees that are produced, which has an enormous effect on both the biodiversity, the plants and animals that live in the system, as well as globally. You know, um, you know, 15 percent of all of the fresh water in the world is from the Amazon rainforest and is dispelled into um, into the ocean. Um, as that cycle gets broken, less trees. If you have less trees, you have less water going up into the air, which then creates a drier environment for the trees that are living there. Which means that they're more prone to possibly die because they don't have enough 
water, which then cre you know, reinforces that cycle. And there's something that scientists have, have come to realize recently, something called aerial rivers. So that water that gets brought up into the, the atmosphere, it actually creates this system of aerial, they call it aerial rivers because there's actually more moisture in the air that gets brought up from the trees than actually is, is in the Amazon River. And those cycles, it's not just in the area that is defined by the, the Amazon basin. It's not just there that this, what these water cycles affect. It affects global climate. Um, and global weather patterns. So in the United States, if we lose the Amazon, we lose rainfall in the West and South and Midwest of the United States. In, in part, Ginger, I envision this as if there are concentric circles in the air over these forests. And the, the concentric circles go from the very center of that circle, where there is the highest humidity, right? All the way out to the edges of the forest where there is the lowest humidity because the that part of the air is being affected by non-forested areas, right? And you need to have the largest greenest uh, part of that circle um, survive in order to have the healthiest forest. And as we cut down trees, we're basically creating deserts in the air. And those deserts in the air can no longer nourish those areas on the ground. So there is a, a interaction. And then of course you have the connection between those, those, if you think of them as almost dome systems, right? Those dome systems are not divided from everything else as uh, Suzanne said, right? The water gets supplied into the, into the oceans. It affects coastal uh, species development and so on. So it really does radiate out. How do we, um, how do we fix this, this system where the incentives that we have, the economic incentives of human beings um, are tilted toward the cutting and the exploitation and the destruction of these, these systems as opposed to building them up and preserving them. Absolutely, I mean, they're, you know, tropical forests are sort of critical forests around the world are critical with stabilizing the, the climate and they provide these kind of uh, natural services that are critical, not just you know in the you know the Amazon, but also other big tropical forest regions like in the in the Congo Basin and Africa, and also you know Southeast Asia and Indonesia, which are the three largest tropical forest regions in the world. And when we you know create unstable you know when there's instability in the in the in the you know the ecosystem, and you start to see you know deforestation rates, you start to see significant drought and things that are impacting you know, other parts of the world. And so that's why it's so critical to really look at what are the key drivers of deforestation? You know? And I think one of the things that we really focus at our organization are who are the biggest financial institutions that are behind driving deforestation infrastructure and who are the biggest you know, brands that are out there, biggest you know, corporations in the commodity sector that are also driving deforestation. And you, when you look at it, you really have to really follow the money and figure out how do we slow down deforestation rates because they are one of the most important solutions when we talk about um, you know, clim you know, climate stability. And so for us, we really focus in on those areas and really focusing on governments. You know, right now governments have a lot of responsibility on you know, putting forward greater protections. And unfortunately, you know, we're seeing deforestation rates going up, especially in this time of COVID where you know, a lot of countries like you know, Brazil are trying to stabilize their economy. You're seeing deforestation rates go up because really relaxing a lot of environmental regulation, uh, which right now is more critical than ever um, when we talk about how to think about solutions um, when looking at the, the, you know, the situation we're currently in with the alarming rates of deforestation that are happening all around the world, particularly in tropical forest regions. Well, it seems that we, um, we have to shift how we view um, extractive industries. Um, whether it's trees or whether it's oil, it seems that we socialize the downside elements of these extractive industries and we privatize the upside exploitation of those industries. So how do we get to the point where the, the full social cost is included at the point of harvest, whether it's oil or whether it's minerals or whether it's, um, and you see this with, with mining in Appalachia, um, or, or a harvesting of trees. How do we do this? And, and, and could you talk a little bit about how your organizations uh, deal with the economics as well as the conservation elements here? Because you have people who live in these forests who are being displaced. 
um, through the, this activity. Suzanne, why don't you uh, give it a cut first and then we'll go to Ginger. Sure. Just to, to add on to what Jim, Ginger was talking about with, with companies, you know, something that we don't consider very often is that, you know, about 70% of South America's GDP is dependent on products from the Amazon. Right. So, um, and you're absolutely right. 70%, you said. Yes. Yeah. We have to get to a point where these costs are incorporated and to where we're just, we're valuing a standing forest more than we're valuing you know, the products of when it's cut. I mean, the, so many studies have been done about the actual value of a hectare forest and, you know, how much money you can get from just clearing the trees, how much, you know, money you can get from cattle. I mean, and, you know, there's, it's something like 10 times more valuable to just have the forest standing because of the ecosystem services that that area is providing. And, you know, as we've just been talking about deforestation, you know, as there are, there is less and less forest, those, those values will be, hopefully should be valued higher and higher. Um, you know, one thing that we do as an, as an organization is, you know, we work directly with the indigenous communities who are living in the forest that are protecting the forest. Um, and, you know, from what we see, you know, we focus a lot on land rights for indigenous people because the data shows that where indigenous people, indigenous peoples control about a quarter of the Amazon. And in the area where they control, deforestation rates are about a third of what they are on other lands. So working on, give, you know, helping indigenous communities to get their, their land rights is a really cost-effective solution to promote and um, protect forests and stop deforestation. So you that's know, one of the things, things that, that, that it seems to me is that uh, the environmental movement has really been very short-sighted for a very long time. The environmental movement, particularly in the United States has been um, largely white folks who look at environment, at the environment and from their position of relative uh, wealth, um, uh, they basically say, this needs to be preserved, right? Comes out of the science, comes out of a, a, a heartfelt convic uh, conviction. This whole issue of providing voice to indigenous peoples was really an afterthought. And the whole idea of the, the economics and, and giving some validity to the economic concerns of people who have to make a living today, it's kind of an afterthought. I, I think we're kind of growing up, aren't we? It, it, you know, as a sector, and we are trying to adjust our own modes of operating, thinking, staffing, uh, boards, interacting with, with people locally. Uh, Ginger, how has that affected you as, you, as you've as you looked at your operations, you've tried to adjust? It's been quite a, quite a humbling experience that all this effort has not had the results that you anticipated. You're changing the way you're operating now, right? Absolutely, I mean, I think everyone is. It's it's, you know, going back on Suzanne's point, it's like at the end of the day, we need to acknowledge the kind of, you know, the colonialistic mindset that's, you know, been put forward to create a lot of the land management that's now managing our forests, you know, all around the world. And if we don't, you know, give uh, the land rights back to the indigenous communities that are, you know, that have been there for, you know, hundreds of years, you know, that, that's really, really key and critical. And that's something that when we're, we're dealing with corporations, I mean, free power informed consent is one of the key things when looking at how lands should be managed and indigenous and frontline communities are actually the best stewards of land. And you see a lot lower levels of deforestation happening in, in key regions. But when you look at, you know, a lot of uh, the infrastructure that's been created, a lot of those those costs are not you know put into the equation, especially with a lot of the big corporations. And an example that I'll talk about is like the you know, palm oil expansion in Indonesia, where for decades, you know, the, the real cost of palm oil expansion, palm oil you know, expansion has not been included as far as the labor costs that goes into, you know, exploiting, you know, the area um, to the land costs and things like that. And so one of the things that RAN is really focused on is centering really customary land rights and first acknowledging whose land 
you know, people are operating in, how governments can shift their patterns and also demanding that, you know, those land rights are acknowledged and really acknowledging the not just the environmental costs, but the human rights costs when you're, you're talking about, you know, a broader e ecosystem and the impact that's happening in that region. As far as RAN organizationally, you know, yeah, we're doing a, a lot of work looking at, you know, uh, systems of oppression and ways that we can really change our practices and really trying to diversify our approach, but at the same time, making sure we're really, you know, empowering and, and, you know, supporting, you know, groups on the front line and really shifting a lot of resources and energy into areas where it's most needed, because I think that that really hasn't been acknowledged for many, many years when looking within the environmental movement, we really need to center the communities that are most impacted and, you know, hand the mic as I love, you know, folks say to folks that are really, you know, dealing with the impact overall. So that's a really important issue that we all need to be addressing and it is critical, um, not just in the nonprofit sector, but across every single sector. Are you shifting board membership and staff membership to reflect those values? Absolutely. You know, we, you know, have more representation of folks in regions that we're working in, especially in particular, a lot of our focus is in Indonesia, um, because palm oil has become such a big, significant driver of deforestation, as well as making sure we have staff in those regions that can speak to the issues at hand. That's really, really important. Um, if I could add, add, Mark, I thank you for bringing up that issue about traditional conservation. And um, I think there's been a lot of awareness in the last five years or so amongst um, conservation organizations. There's been a lot of talk. And if you look at the, the language that the big conservation groups are using, it's people focused. There's you know a lot of discussion about indigenous peoples, um, but there's a lot to make up for. Um, and, you know, there's been over 100 million people have been displaced around the world because of conservation over the years, 100 million people. Um, and so I'm hopeful that there's a lot more discussion and, and language about it, um, but we still, we do have, have a long way to go. Um, because indigenous people, you know, they cover, their territories are 65% of the earth. There, you know, more than half of the earth is, is under indigenous collective um, management and they only have rights to 10%. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for this mindset to change and then for us to really put our policies into place that reflect that data. One of the things that strikes me is that, it, is that we're, we get involved in this specious argument about, um, about um, uh, the opposition, whoever we are, Right, if we're right leaning, left leaning, or you know, an indigo, whoever we are, it's the opposition is getting a handout or getting government support or whatever it is. What's really happening is that we're all struggling for our interests and we don't necessarily listen to the interests of others enough. We just took a poll, and um, uh, two of the polls are really interesting, the third one's coming up. Uh, the, the first uh, uh, poll was, what is the most important driver in efforts to preserve rainforests? One is rich in biodiversity. The, the um, that rainforest sequester uh, carbon and slow uh, climate change um, got the most votes, 71%. And uh, indigenous people live in rainforests and their land rights should be respected. That was 18%. So we have those three different elements. Um, but really when it comes right down to it, um, the, the marketing of carbon to create that sense, that's being highly successful. But really the answer is, is all of the above, right? It's, it's biodiversity, it's, it's carbon sequestration, it's respect for fellow human beings. And then we asked the second poll, which was really interesting. Uh, I'm sorry, we, went, we skipped over the second, we somehow got to the third. Uh, the third poll was... Um, uh, who should, how do we ensure the human rights and interests of indigenous peoples, okay? And then we ask a set of scaled questions, first giving indigenous people sort of ownership rights, right? They decide, it's their land. Uh, the second piece is that they should have a seat at the table, and the third, that experts should evaluate. 67% felt that, that, um, that at least a seat at the table, and 27% actually felt that there were ownership rights that indigenous people actually decide on, on how the land is used. Um, how do you see the dynamics shaping out so that uh, we can respect 
um, the different interests here in a way that that really focuses on human values um, and is sustainable. Suzanne, you want to give it give a start to this one? Well, I think it's going to. I mean, I think we've moved in that direction, um, and it's it's going to be very uncomfortable um, for governments. I mean, indigenous people are more, I mean, just within the past, you know, five years or so, are they actually have more of a voice at international conventions and meetings. Um, you know, they still don't have the same say that member states, states have, but there's, you know, it's moving in a certain direction. Um, I think you're, you know, you're right about climate change is all of a sudden there's renewed attention on forests and the stewards of those forests. It's the issue that in my career, there's a, it has brought up this issue. It's raised awareness more than any, anything else. Um, and so, you know, I think just the more and more that we embrace the facts and you look at the, that data, I know data doesn't necessarily move hearts, but I, you know, I would hope that, you know, now we're entering a period of more fact-based um, policy development and that we see that if we are going to stop the climate crisis, we have to stop deforestation. And the only way to do it if cost effectively is to uh, support the indigenous people that are managing those forests and make sure that they get the support they need, that money for um, forest protection does not stay at the international and national, you know, in the capital of the countries where the deforestation is happening. Ginger, how do you balance the interests that are local uh, in country um, versus the global interests? Uh, because there is certainly a global interest in pre preserving rainforests, uh, but you also can't have international institutions run roughshod over uh, countries like Brazil. How do you deal with that? Yeah, it's it's definitely complicated, but it's you know it's it's critical that. Indigenous, you know, communities and people on the front lines are at the decision making table and that we create and demand that space is, is always there. And I think that, you know, that's why, you know, international corporations and financial institutions who have a really, you know, focused interest in these other regions that they acknowledge one, the customary land rights of communities on the front lines and as well as are open to making sure they're at the table when making decisions around the way that they're investing, the way they're do, doing business, that there's some type of consultation that goes along with the process and that that is so critical. And at the same time, if those steps aren't happening, be willing to pull their business out of those areas that are have a large you know, risk, not only to the communities on the ground, but also reputation and financial risk to the companies. And I think we've seen that in Brazil. We see that in, you know, Southeast Asia. And so, you know, that's kind of where, you know, our organization really demands and pushbacks on corporations that are not centering the human rights and environmental costs at the forefront when going into these type of, you know, practices and really trying to expose them and put the spotlight on those kind of bad actors that are out there. Um, and that's really, you know, what goes into a large kind of markets campaign to really apply that pressure, making sure that those voices on the ground are really heard and that they are part of the decision-making process. So that's, that's a really interesting point. So it's not just the, the business side, it's not just the right side, it's also human perceptions, right? It's trying to encourage our neighbors who might be investors to not invest in activities that are detrimental to the planet. Um, it's, it's trying to uh, encourage ourselves to not buy uh, wood products that might come from uh, places that are the result of deforestation. Right? It's, it's the little things and we have to change our behaviors. We have to change our attitudes, right? Absolutely. It's, it's trying to, you know, right now looking at the supply chains and trying to get, you know, not only the financial institutions, but large, you know, commodity traders to commit to zero deforestation in their, in their business model. You know, there's a lot of policies out there that, you know, companies have made, but at the same time, there's also got to be the government regulatory, you know, initiatives that are taking place as well. So I think there is just a lot more opportunity as Suzanne was you know, stating, there's more of these dialogues happening in bigger global forums, but there's gotta be the will of the, you know, the countries. And that's why it's so important when you have these governments that get in control who completely dis don't even acknowledge the rights of indigenous communities where you see this major shift in one deforestation rates going up in places like you know, Indonesia because of Bolsonaro and his, um, you know, his regime. So it's really not only, you know, demanding that governments, you know, shift, but it's also 
getting corporations to shift who they're doing business with. And if they're not aligned with the, you know, those kind of Z, you know, zero deforestation initiatives and really changing their business, um, which what we're really focusing on right now um, through our, you know, our markets work. Bolsonaro is, is Brazil, you meant? Absolutely, yeah. Bolsonaro, the president of Brazil, who under his, you know, um, presidency, you know, you've seen deforestation rates really go through the roof because he completely does not acknowledge indigenous, you know, land rights. Um, um, he's a very racist president and has a very top-down approach. And so I think that he kind of has that old school, you know, way of looking at things. And, and that's something that we just have to really shift and demand that companies and banks don't do business with them as long as, you know, he's um, really exploiting not only the people, but the resources and the Brazilian Amazon. In terms of uh, your program, Suzanne, could you just talk a little bit about some of the uh, most important programs that you are implementing to create change? Mm -hmm. and to preserve? Because, you know, while we're talking, trees are being cut down, yeah. right? Deforestation is progressing. Uh, we haven't really slowed the pace. And as a matter of fact, given the fact that the, uh, these rainforests are shrinking, uh, in proportion to the size of the rainforest, we seem to be seeing an acceleration. Uh, talk about the most important investments that you're making mm -hmm. to change that dynamic. Okay. Um, two things. One that we've done since day one as an organization for over 30 years is focus on helping communities get their land rights. So that's just, you know, as we've been talking, because we know it works, we have an expertise in it. So we're working with communities um, in many, several different countries across the Amazon to push for their rights where there's still claims that are outstanding that... Um, and then the second thing that we've been, um, what we're doing a lot more now and we see more, as, a lot of the future of what we do is community-based monitoring of forest destruction um, because so much illegal activity, so much deforestation is illegal. The vast majority of, of deforestation in the Amazon is illegal. Um, and a lot of that just goes unseen. And so here, and it happens in indigenous or near indigenous communities. So what we're doing is um, empowering, training um, indigenous technicians and local community members to monitor what's happening on the ground, monitor the deforestation. There's a lot of new technological tools now with remote sensing data and deforestation alerts and smartphones that are cheap and easy to use. Um, and so um, there's, an, We've developed a system where in local communities to monitor what they're doing and, and integrate that into what they know works, their traditional monitoring system, their traditional governance system. So by integrating those two things, we found that they can decrease deforestation even more. So that's a big push for what we're doing as an organization to scale that across the Amazon. Ginger, is it possible to in any, in any way reforest areas? Um, yeah, it's not, you know, there's definitely, rainforests are very resilient. They can bounce back. There's a lot of in areas that we've worked in in Southeast Asia where they've, you know, pulled out, you know, illegal palm oil plantations and the forest has, you know, come back, you know, after a few years. Um, but it's, uh, we don't, you know, keeping forest standing is the best solution instead of just going in and creating a monoculture, just replanting trees. Um, right. So, yeah, I think that that's the, the top goal is to keep the original intact forest there. Um, but yeah, tree planting and stuff, you know, is I think good in urban areas, but as far as replacing a, a tropical rainforest, once you impact that ecosystem, you know, you can't really return to its original state, but it, it, it is pretty resilient. So that's why, you know, we, I think both our organizations are so forced with, you know, focused on keeping those original forests intact and keeping forest standing is the, the number one, you know, most important solution. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that, Ginger, that we also, you know, focusing on forest protection, that, um, but knowing that because we've reached a crisis point across the world, that we do have to replant as well. And, you know, whether that's our organizations that are going to be doing that on a massive scale that's going to actually make a difference, not sure. We are starting to do that with Indigenous communities, um, but we know it has to be part of the solution also. We just well, lost too much. Suzanne, I'll let you have the last word. Uh, Ginger Cassidy, thank you so much for uh, describing the work of the Rainforest Action Network. So important. And Suzanne Pelletier, Executive Director of the Rainforest Foundation uh, U.S., very important work, and it's really important that we all get engaged. On that note, um, as, as I said on Thursday, we're, we're going to be talking about domestic violence. 
Um, what we're trying to do in these programs is to get Americans engaged in the things that actually affect our daily lives. Um, we all spend a lot of time uh, being entertained by uh, various programs and the news is all about politics and violence and so on. But there are so many things, whether it's education uh, of, of children or neighbors uh, living in hunger or homelessness or environmental conservation that we all need to get involved. And we figured half an hour uh, twice a week was a great way of sort of sharing information from people whose passion, like you, Suzanne, and like you, Ginger, and, and, your, and your folks and your supporters, whose passions run in, in particular directions and we can all benefit from them. That's the nonprofit report. Thank you both for being part of the show and we'll see you all uh, next Thursday. Take care, thank you.